Good afternoon, everyone. We will get started in just a few minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We will get started in about one minute. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathy Hawk, Associate Dean for External Relations and Global Programs. Thank you so much for joining us for our third iLead of the semester. And in just a moment, I will introduce our speaker, Daryl Carter and Dean Dave. But for now, I wanna start with three things that you need to know for our session. First, chat is disabled. Second, we will be taking Q&A throughout the session. So please enter it through the Q&A function in Zoom. Third, we'll turn to Q&A after the fireside chat between Dean Dave and Daryl, and we will take as many of your questions as possible. It is my pleasure to introduce Daryl Carter, founder, chairman, and CEO of Avanath Capital Management. Avanath is a California-based investment firm that acquires, renovates, and operates apartment properties with an emphasis on affordable and workforce communities. Daryl directs overall strategy and operations for the company. Since its formation in 2008, Avanath has acquired $2.5 billion of properties across 13 states in the US, comprising over 10,000 apartment units. Daryl has 39 years of experience in commercial real estate. He was previously the executive managing director of Centerline Capital Group after his firm, Capri Capital Finance, was acquired by Centerline in 2005. Daryl co-founded Capri and built a diversified real estate investment firm with $8 billion in real estate equity. Prior to Capri, Daryl was regional vice president for Westinghouse Credit Corporation and second vice president at Continental Bank. Daryl holds a master's in architecture from MIT 
an MBA from the MIT Sloan School of Management, a bachelor's in science and architecture from the University of Michigan. And Daryl is a member of our MIT Sloan Executive Board, the Sloan Visiting Committee, and the 2015 recipient of the Distinguished Alumni Board and Convocation uh, Alumni Award and Convocation Speaker at MIT Sloan. We are thrilled to have Daryl here today and I will turn things over to Dean Dave to kick us off. Thank you, Kathy. Daryl, it's so great to see you. It's always a pleasure to welcome you back to MIT, to the Sloan School. Um, and even now when we have to do it virtually, um, but you know, this is a special day, it's a special time. It's special because you're here, but it's special for lots of reasons. And I'm really grateful. I know that you probably have a very long list of things that need doing today, um, but to spend it with us means a lot to me and I thank you for it. Um, we have a lot to talk about, um, so we'll dive right in. Um, one of the things that um, I'd love you to start with is, um, uh, I know that there's a lot of news about you and about Avanath and um, things that are going on. Before we get to that, um, can I have you um, help us be grounded in um, what Avanath Capital Management does and how it does it from the standpoint of its purpose and its structure? Um, you know, you are a social impact organization in many respects. Um, and so you meet the needs of the country, but you also have to meet the needs of investors. And so can you talk a little bit about what Avanath is and how you do that? Thanks, Dave. It's great to be here. I just wish it was actually in person because, you know, the, you cannot get good chowder here So in <laughs> California. So I'd rather be there to actually get the great seafood. But anyway, thank you. It's such a delight to be here. You know, MIT is such a special place to me. And, and even uh, being on the campus or being here in this way, I'm always delighted. Um, you know, we, you know, when, when you look at... Um, if, if you're, there's one theme of my career and in, in really building two separate companies, it's about investing capital in areas that have been underserved by institutional capital. And, and you know, one of the things that, um, you know, I can encourage everyone who might be listening when they're looking at entrepreneurial activities to think about what people are not doing and maybe, or what they're doing and maybe you can do better. But, you know, we, you know, I, I grew up uh, in Detroit. My dad was an auto worker and, and um, you know, and part of that is really the journey, uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s, there was a major deterioration in my neighborhood. And I really learned that the, the root cause of that is a lack of investment in that community. And when you invest in communities, invest in jobs, housing, a variety of things, you can make meaningful change. And so, um, that really has been the direction of my career. You know, we, um, at Avanath, we spend a lot of time, uh, we, we invest in housing in many urban communities. And, and, you know, we've taken on some of the more challenging urban communities in this country to provide quality housing in those communities that lack them. So, you know, we were in markets like West uh, West Oakland before it became trendy, and now Google is is now investing in that area. Uh, North Long Beach, South Central Los Angeles, South Chicago, and to make investments with quality housing, um, generally we our model is to acquire and renovate, but to to keep uh, rents affordable, but still you know we have 49 institutional investors that. Uh, invest capital because they want to make money. And we believe that making money for investors makes the, 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 the mission sustainable. Uh, many approach affordable housing from a nonprofit standpoint, and we felt that we could make money and do the right things as well. And when you can, it becomes very scalable because you can make money. And, and today, I would say our investors who you know, are some of the most prestigious names in, in the country, uh, TIA, Prudential Insurance and the like, um, they like the fact that A, we make money for them, but B, we're making change in communities. And uh, so that's an overview of what we do, but we basically acquire uh, 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 
uh, apartments, older apartments that need lots of investment, we invest in them, but we also invest in them smartly in the sense that um, we're not trying to, uh, we think it's a flawed business model to buy an older property and, you know, try to double the rents and spend a lot of money. You know, we, we invest in the basic things to make it nicer, clean, safe, and all the other things, but we, we optimize on trying to keep it affordable. Uh, through value engineering on every little thing that we do, we think about it in terms of how it translates into rent. So that's um, an overview of what we do. I, I, well, beautiful. Um, one of the things that I love about Avanath is when it was founded, and you've before, I know, um, with me at least, talked a bit about um, getting the capital to get this concept going um, in 2008, roughly speaking. I mean, as I recall, um, those were not exactly boom times uh, for the country. And so, um, you know, there was something about um, interesting investors in emerging markets. Could you talk a little bit about getting the capital in the first place? Well, you know, there have been many efforts, you know, and, and our investor base, they tend to be insurance companies, a few banks, a lot of large pension funds. Uh, increasingly, we have attracted um, institutional investors in Europe and Asia. And many investors want to find emerging markets. Of course, there was a lot of discussion about the BRIC countries, I think Brazil, Russia, India, China, and finding emerging markets there. There, were, there have been different efforts about that. And what we've tried to convince institutional investors, or at least show them, is that we have emerging markets right here in the US that can grow and that can, um, you know, people, there's lots of demand for, um, um, for gro you know, grocery stores, a variety of different things. So we've tried to make, and as opposed to making the social case, we, we make the business case uh, of, of providing that there are some opportunities. Um, you know, we, you know, one of the things that, that I'm most pleased about that we started and, you know, literally sometimes you have ideas of things. And one day I was in Seattle and we just went to Amazon's office and we said, have you guys ever thought about doing things in some of the communities? And, you know, you guys have a great business model. And, and what literally was walking in and off the street, we eventually be, created a dialogue with Amazon that we now have Amazon lockers at a lot of our apartment communities where um, there are very few, there's not a lot of great retail outlets, but we said, look, if you put these lockers at our communities, our people will have great access to goods, but now they're doing cold storage lockers where they can have access to whole foods. So, so much of what we do are finding solutions and, you know, and, and taking advantage of trends that are happening. I mean, we are going through this major kind of redo of the way retail um, operates. And I'm sure you and there are many people at MIT that are studying these things. And, and so the reality of trying to get major grocery stores to go in communities, when they're shutting them down across the country, we have to think a little bit out of the box and say, well, you know, what can we take advantage of in this whole e-commerce world providing, um, you know, so we, we, I would say that that has been a big feature at a number of our communities where we've installed, and I think we have them in now probably a dozen. And it is a, you know, it's our residents love it. You know, it's more business for Amazon and, and, um, and people have access for a variety of goods that they can't go right down the street and get. And so uh, it's just fascinating. Um, it, it's also um, uh, such a great indicator of the way that you've thought creatively and with innovation about uh, what can be done uh, to ensure that these markets are emerging markets. They're not just challenged markets. And um, that's right. Uh, it, that's, um, but it, it doesn't do it by itself. Um, by the way, can I just, I know I'm not supposed to be talking too much here, um, <laughs> but to the, um, to your insight into getting people to think more about emerging markets in the United States, I just want to call out, um, you know where I'm going with this. I yes. was once in a meeting with you in front of a bunch of the rest of MIT's leaders, 
getting very poetic about what the Sloan School has done with its global entrepreneurship uh, 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 program and um, making a difference in lots of different countries around the world. And uh, you gently raised your hand and said, wow, that's really a great program. I, if only there were some emerging markets here in the United States, is it, <laughs> such a thing. And um, you prompted the creation of USA Lab, which is um, uh, something that we've been doing for the last couple of years now. But um, there's so much to thank you for. And <laughs> we, we need to get back to, um, uh, to the story. So, you know, can I just ask one more question about the your insights into what makes uh, Aventith a pro able to be a profitable business. Um, because, you know, there are a lot of organizations that either run buildings down or don't make a profit. And so um, I, I feel like you've learned some things along the way about what makes neighborhoods safe and what makes Aventith able to be profitable. You know, the, 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 the most important thing of any business is strong customer service. And, you know, when you look at the metrics of the apartment industry or any business. It's, it's um, one, getting customers there and keeping them as customers. And so, you know, one of the things that is an overlooked metric in the apartment industry, I mean, people tend to focus on rent growth, how quickly I can raise my rents and how fast. And I think in a way, what, what that creates is this model where eventually you end up having a lot of people move out and you get newer people that move in and it creates this turnover model. Um, a lot of people don't realize this, but notwithstanding issues with college students coming in and out, the, the most apartment communities in the US have turnover of 40 to 60% a year. So 40 to, so figure 50% of the residents leave after a year and then there's more residents. There are considerable frictional costs in that because you're retenanting the apartments, you're repainting, you're doing all these things. And so our business model is our turnover is somewhere about 15% a year. We wanna get good people in and, if we, and, and have them stay. So all of a sudden, if you look at the economics of having 10 or 15% turnover, your turnover costs are considerably lower. And it really makes for where you can have a more consistent, sustainable cash flow. And, and instead of seven or 8% rent increases, we're just fine with one and a half to 3% rent increases, and, and which keeps it modest, but keeping people there. Uh, the other thing is that we've learned that what makes a community safer is one thing. I mean, it, and we, you know, you look at all the different things. We can do armed security, we can do this, we can do all kinds of cameras, and we, can, and we do some of those things. But the most important thing is for people to know their neighbors. If they know their neighbors, and if you can create strong communities where people stay there, they know whose kids are whom, and, you know, and they see things and they start saying, you know, we think there's an apartment where someone's selling drugs. Then we try to address that. So, you know, the, those are, you know, you have to take, and really a lot of it, this gets back to, you know, the Sloan School and analytics is looking at data very differently and kind of outside of the conventional way. You know, people look more in the apartment industry top line. We look at expenses and bottom line, and we've learned that if we really manage that through lowering turnover that we can maintain housing sustainability for people longer where their average stay in our community is generally six you know five to seven years yes but but that's analytics <laughs> yeah. so um uh this business has succeeded it's been growing um in fact i think uh let me ask i think you have um uh, just bought your first um uh, residential property in Boston, and yes. um, uh, uh, so uh, welcome to Boston. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we've and, been trying to get there for six or seven years. It's been one of the favorite places we wanted to be, but we finally have our first investment in Boston, which is 200 unit property in Mattapan. Uh, so we're very excited. Um, so I'm assuming that when you go someplace new, you know, you have to find the right property. I mean, if the right property at the right price just isn't available, then 
you know, the, the, the region can be as appealing as it wants to. Um, but then the region matters also, right? I mean, as you think about- Well, we think that Boston, I mean, we're in Seattle. I mean, there are a number of cities that are very similar to Boston. We're in Denver, we're in Austin, we're in Seattle. These are very intellectually driven um, uh, economies that also have a big workforce component. I mean, if you look at MIT, um, I mean, certainly there's professors and administrators and deans, but there are also people who work in the cafeteria who, yes. you know, you cannot sustain a university without that, you know, a workforce. And so you have to think where those people are gonna live. And, that, and so in many of our invest, you know, one of the reasons we like knowledge base, um, you know, locations because they have this huge workforce of people that need affordable housing. And so Boston is a exhibit one of that. And, and um, you know, so, but the, this deal was very interesting in that our, and, and one of the things underlying housing affordability and affordable housing, you have public housing agencies that their mission is to provide quality housing for people of low and moderate income. You know, we often hear, and, and a lot of people, there are misnomers about the Section 8 program, which I won't get into, but it's a subsidy program for people of low and moderate income. Um, you know, from an eligibility standpoint, that there, for every 10 people who are eligible for a Section 8 voucher, there's one voucher. So it's, it's a challenge we have politically with housing affordability. Um, and so one of the things that we do, and one of our very important constituents is to engage with housing authorities. And you know, very often we are engaged with housing authorities before we do any business in a city. And we started that dialogue with the city of Boston. And we actually, you know, one of the things that we've been successful in doing are buying old public housing projects and converting them to private ownership and renovating them, but keeping them affordable. So we were actually exploring that with a property in Boston that was a, a, a public housing project. And this property came available right next to them. And they said, well, you know, you ought to think about doing that and maybe we can create some incentives to keep the rents low. And, and so we had a negotiation with the city of Boston and the existing residents to limit their rent increases over the next five years and the city of Boston provided us some economics that package that made it profitable for us to then buy that asset. And um, it was a win-win for all. I mean, I think that the mayor was tremendous and his team and, you know, we work with a, uh, there was a, 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 a group that um, uh, is involved with organizing tenant organizations that had organized them and immediately you know, posted things about us and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. But we ended up going into a dialogue with them and, and very respectful dialogue and they were very respectful and we worked out something that was really a win-win that candidly, it, it, there was such a positive outcome. The city and this tenants advocacy group said, you know, we need to replicate this in other places. So, you know, our intent when we came to Boston is to do, you know, we like to own 1,500 to 2,000 units in a market. And so we still have a lot of work to do, but I'm delighted to be in Boston because it still is one of my favorite cities. And, and I, I get to come and see all my friends at MIT and have great seafood. Uh -huh. <laughs> so um, so there's, there's um, additional news um, and I was hoping we could touch on it also. I think actually today in terms of the, um, uh, going public with some information. You've seen this growth and you've been creating this growth um, with the particular um, set of investors that you have um, that have um, worked through um, Avana um, uh, to create these housing options. Um, so tell me about the news of the day. There's a well, different model that you're going to pursue, yes? We, uh, about the uh, first week of October, we filed an S11 to create a public uh, entity, which we are calling Aspire Real Estate Investors, which will be a publicly traded entity on the New York Stock Exchange. We started with a very good friend who uh, is uh, by a, a company called McFarland Partners, uh, owned by a good friend of mine by the name of Victor McFarland. And Victor 
uh, who really is one of the first African-American uh, real estate investors that really focused on investing in inner city communities. And, and Victor uh, started in the, you know, late in the late 80s, but actually was involved and in people uh, know of uh, a fellow Michigander, not University of Michigan, but Michigan State person, Magic Johnson. Um, Victor was Magic's first backer when he started doing various real estate endeavors and they created really one of the first um, urban investment partnerships with CalPERS, which really was the pioneer in doing many of the things that uh, we've been doing. And so Victor and I, his, you know, we are probably t the two largest African-American owned real estate companies in the country. We decided to come together to really uh, create a public entity to, um, to, to gain access to the capital markets where we can do more in uh, some of the markets that we, we focused on. And, and it also provided a mechanism to potentially uh, provide a greater amount of capital and also uh, in the public market permanent capital uh, because most of our investment funds have a 10 year, they're 10 year closed in funds where you know, a lot of our investors will say, wow, you've done some amazing things and you're gonna sell it and say, well, you know, we, we gotta get your money back and this is what we have to do, but it provides another source of capital where we can have a longer term lasting impact on some of the communities we invest in. So we're very excited and uh, we filed that in October and our road show is, is happening. We actually are starting tomorrow. So we're very excited. So it was supposed to be today, but we decided to move it back another day. Okay. Well, I hope we didn't get you in trouble by talking about it here. No, no, uh, no, I, I'm good. <laughs> well, but it is very exciting. And uh, I think of one part of your history as being um, creative with respect to how to serve the public, uh, but also creative with respect to acquiring capital and helping people see um, that there is profit in doing good. And um, I just think that's a, a remarkable story. You know, Dave, one of the key things that I've learned about raising capital, and of course, every it, it is hard. It is without a doubt the hardest part of any business. But the one key thing that we have learned is very often you have to have the metrics of what the risks are and, and many things like investing in some, you know, we, we had, you know, in the 60s and 70s, there was massive redlining by institutional investors, banks, insurance companies in, in certain communities. And that's sort of the, the, the commentary most people think about. And, you know, there's still lots of myths. When you say affordable housing, people think of housing projects. They think of you know, they think of very negative things. So part of our challenge in building this company, and of course, even pursuing, you know, the public market is creating the, the, the data that says, this is a very safe investment that provides appropriate risk adjusted returns. But you still deal with a lot of, um, you know, just interesting things. We had a prospective investor who was looking at one of our properties in, in, in a very nice suburban location in Northern Virginia in Loudoun County, which is one of the most affluent communities in the country. And we have two properties there. And, you know, these are, and, and Loudoun County, I mean, most of our communities serve people who are at 60% of area median income or lower. But in Loudoun County, the median income is 120,000 a year. So you're serving people who make 70,000 who work, you know, it's a very high cost area, but you're teachers and the like. And so the investor called me and said, I'm going there tomorrow and I just need to check one thing, it, just to have to ask, and I'm sorry, but you think I'm going to get shot when I go there? Oh my God. <laughs> so my response is, well, I don't know your personal situation. I don't know if you have people angry at you for something, but if it's a matter of going to my apartment community at 10 o'clock on a work day, you will go there and you will see that 95% of the place is empty because everybody there works. And so, 
you know, but there are these kinds of myths that you're dealing with when you talk about affordable housing. Unfortunately, matters of race get intertwined in it, and you know, which it shouldn't, because the affordability challenges in in um, uh, uh, you know just reach, you know, uh, they reach a lot of communities. I mean, I, I had the uh, the privilege. Uh, one of the you know part of our new investment. Uh, vehicle is focusing on opportunity zones, um, which are with this legislation that was created. And, and through some of the things that we're doing, I bec I've become very good friends with Senator Tim Scott, who was really the architect of the opportunity zone legislation. And, and um, you know, of course, when you're in my industry in affordable housing, there's a lot of connections with Washington. So I spend a lot of time there. And he convened a group of senators, both parties, and to talk about some of the affordable housing challenges. And I happened to sit next to a incredibly bright woman who was a senator from, who just got reelected, uh, Senator um, uh, Shelley Capito from West Virginia. And we were talking about some of the challenges and on in neighborhoods in Chicago, and she was talking about some of the challenges in places in West Virginia, and they're identical. And you know, these are things. Some of these challenges with housing in America, they have no racial boundaries. They, you know, they they exist in rural communities. They they exist in urban communities. They even exist in some suburban communities. And so, getting the the dialogue to focus on the issue without you know, the things that, that the noise that comes in about race and, and other things is something that we've tried to do and really keep the discussion focused on data, you know, return risk, you know, and just nothing else, you know, and, and uh, so part of our challenge is building the, the appropriate performance data. And, and the great thing now, our portfolio is about 11,000 apartments, so we can start having some consistency of data that we can show people. Yes, <clears throat> um, uh, that would be a great story for any time, but um, for today and for our times. Um, yes. Uh, I, I, I wish I could uh, put it on my iPhone and listen to it a couple <laughs> times a day. Uh, uh, so you talked about the public sector a little bit. Um, you've been visible in the public uh, mind and the public eye with respect to um, the importance and the means of providing affordable housing. Um, uh, you've also been thoughtful about the ways that diversity and inclusion and equity and the pandemic kind of um, overlap, coincide, um, double down on each other. Um, uh, you've been associated with a housing call to action, um, I believe that um, maybe, could you say a few words about that? Um, well, you know, one of the, the, the great things that I feel very blessed about, and this, this, was, this is the, the uh, result of 39 years in an industry, you get to know quite a few people and they know you and, and you develop a track record. And, and so uh, I think with many of these social justice issues that there are, there are some solutions that, um, you know, that I think as an industry, the apartment industry, I mean, and when you look you know, specifically uh, at that industry, um, and when you look at the home ownership rates of different groups, you know, 40% of the apartment industry are African American and Latino. And so my message to the apartment industry is, look, we have skin in the game relative to outcomes for 40% uh, of our residents. They're our customers. So it's, I mean, so again, not trying to make as much the social case, but the business case. And there is absolutely a correlation between some of the criminal justice issues and the investment in certain neighborhoods. I mean, there's just one that I always like to, to cite. We bought a property in North Long Beach, which is a somewhat challenged community where we had, when we bought it, there were 20 police calls a week at this community, 528 apartments. And it was, it was candidly, there were lots of challenges there. And so, you know, so that's 80 police calls a week and 900, almost a thousand a year. So we 
one of the issues, you know, there are 528 apartments. We found out there were 1,200 kids that lived there and there was nothing for them to do. So we bought this property very, I mean, part of what drives our economic returns is that many people have given up on a property like this. So we could buy it really, really cheaply. And so we bought it cheaply, but we also decided we had to be strategic and making investments. So we put uh, against conventional wisdom of the apartment industry, we put a huge basketball court in the center of it. We organized leagues and different things like that. We started mentorship programs. We interacted with gang members. We, all of a sudden we started doing things. We created after school programs and all these things we could do because we bought it cheap enough that we could put these things in and the tra it translated into much higher, you know, it's right now, this, this used to be a property people had to live at. Uh, today, we have a waiting list of 400 people that want to live in that. And so we went from having 20 police calls, 80 police calls a month, maybe there's one or two a week for something, someone's car alarm. I mean, it, the, 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 Crime profile has changed everything. We have Amazon lockers there, all these things. So all of a sudden now we have maybe you have five police calls a month. So we just went from 1,000 to 60. Now you have, you know, 900 plus less situations where the police are going to show up. The probability, and, and we, and I, you know, I still know statistics from Arnie Barnett, the probability that if you've gone from a thousand to you know fifty or sixty, you just have far less possibilities for there to be an adverse police community interaction. If they're not having to come, the likelihood of it being an adverse. So I mean, just the simple math of that. And we explain this to investors that hey, these things are absolutely correlated. And so Again, not trying to make the, the this is right or anything like that, but the, look, this is, this is something that's tangible. And so that's, you know, repeat, we try to look at every aspect of our business and translate it into some metric. I mean, this is why I would say that the data, our focus on data is probably the biggest game changer in the affordable housing business is because we've created metrics for certain things. And again, thank you, the Sloan School of Management for grounding me in the, in the value of data. You're welcome. <laughs> and, and I'm glad you thanked Arnie Barnett as well, who, as you know, is still teaching generation yes. after generation of our students. Um, I learned um, to play poker from him. <laughs> Perhaps that's not something I you want on you. <laughs> there are many things I choose not to listen to from our alums and our students. <laughs> uh, so we, uh, I want to ask you about the pandemic a little bit, if I could. Yes. Um, and um, surely there have been challenges associated with it, maybe some learnings that aren't only challenges, but I, I, talk about the pandemic, if you would. Well, it's it's been difficult in many ways. I mean, one of which is when you just think about when you have stay at work um, orders, uh, people in apartment communities who are, who are normally not there during the day, they're there 24 seven. So all the challenges of having people home all day. Um, so that's one aspect. And, and then creating um, operationally uh, the, the, the appropriate sanitation, social distancing, all those things within our communities, you know, which we had to implement. Now, when you talk about where most of our properties are horizontal, they're not vertical. So that makes the common area thing a lot easier. Um, so, you know, operationally dealing with that, but also, you know, we do the on-site management. So having our maintenance techs have to go into apartments and making sure they have the, the appropriate safety protection and the like. And, you know, like everybody was on this, you know, the ability to get cleaning supplies and things like that. And, and um, uh, so, you know, those are ch operational challenges. But then of course there are financial challenges in that, um, 
you know, a lot of our, you know, when you have residents that have job losses and, you know, and, and how they continue to pay rent. And, you know, the, the great thing about um, our business, uh, about 50% of our residents have our Section 8 voucher holders, meaning that they pay one third of their income and the government pays the difference. Now, the, 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 we did address those people in the first CARES bill. So that part of our resident base is fine. And then we have a, a percentage of our residents. We have about 15% that are seniors, affordable communities. They rely on pensions. They're fine. So, you know, we've had to work with some, a few residents. I mean, fortunately, out of 11,000 of our uh, households, we've had to about 50 or 60 modifications where we have worked with people. Um, and in many of the communities we're in, uh, you know, a lot of people are working. I mean, we've had very few job losses in California. We've had very few in the Washington, D.C. I guess government keeps, you know, they keep people employed. They don't do a lot of layoffs, but that, that's been so you know, we had some initial issues in Orlando. We have a couple of communities very close to Disney World, uh, but now Disney World's back open. But, you know, we have tried to work with residents and, and even those that are working, you know, they have to deal with childcare issues and their kids are on school online and just creating, um, you know, some, some abilities for, you know, I mean, there's in some, uh, places we uh, created some community Wi-Fi rooms where kids can, where the, maybe they could not afford Wi-Fi, but they could come to somewhere within our community to use Wi-Fi. And so we've done things like that. But it, you know, it's it's uh, this period of time has required lots of of creativity and vigilance. I mean, just you know, we're in 13 states navigating the particularly local regulations. I mean, one of the unfortunate things about our deal in Boston, none of our senior, only one person senior in our executive leadership could get there because Massachusetts, the governor kept people from places like California for flying there. I mean, just, you know, navigating this country with these, you know, it's almost like being, every state has their own visa policy. So, um, but, you know, we, as any organization, I think that uh, we've learned a lot. Um, we've learned, you know, I mean, we we have been remote. I'm in my office today, but we have about 90 people in our office and our headquarters in Irvine, and we probably have 15 or 20 that are coming in, and and um, you know, and we're able to to work remotely just fine. Um, and part of it, we invested very much in technology um, over the years. So, you know, we're, we're able to do a lot of things from a phone or a tablet. So we kind of created that. Uh, so, you know, technology is, is very important to every business, even though we are in a low tech business. So um, I think, you know, one of the stories of the pandemic is, um, a bit of the rise of telemedicine, which was, you know, sort of stuck on the back burner for a long time. And then, you know, of necessity, um, some new technology being used. And it, it sounds like in um, housing as well, uh, one of the consequences of the pandemic has been maybe some technology that has been coming, but slowly um, is maybe accelerating. And I, I, if that's- uh, Well, we, you know, we had people that, um, you know, who are, we were doing virtual tours with people in our Boston and we could just post those and, and while they're walking a property, we could see what people were looking at. And so, you know, the, the technology, uh, you know, it's, I mean, we're in a, the, the great thing about our business, it's hard to um, disrupt where people are going to live. People still need a physical home to live. And, and we certainly have lots of issues to address in that regard. So we, we can't, you know, you can maybe get rid of the retail um, store by through Amazon, but there's not, you know, so people physically, I mean, you know, they still need a place to live. So that's, but then figuring out how to deliver 
the things, particularly the, the, the care and the cleanliness and all of our communities of having to still deliver that physically and to make it safe for our residents and make it safe for our, our staff. So yes. those are the challenges. But, you know, I think this is a time and I tend to be more hopeful that I think people have really adapted and, you know, I think we've seen the best of, of, of America during this. I mean, I tend to be an optimist and, and notwithstanding that this has been sad in terms of the deaths and things like that, but I think we've seen a lot of greatness that has come out of this. I mean, I, again, I guess in my business, I just have learned to be optimistic. Um, well, but if I can, you've also uh, been disciplined, you've been innovative, and you've been analytical. And um, I think maybe some of that is a little bit of the MIT uh, in you. Yes. Uh, and Michigan, too. We'll give them some. Yes. Of <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, so I want to um, see if we have um, folks who would like to ask you questions without me being in the way. Um, maybe as a transition to that, just if you want to say one last word about MIT itself, you don't have to, but I hope that we make you proud. Um, you certainly make us proud. And well, that, you know, the US I think, you know, I, I feel very blessed to have spent the time at MIT and I still, every time I walk into that place, I get, I get goosebumps. And, uh, you know, I think that, that what we've tried to do is take many things that I learned there and use them in a way that are, un, you know, unconventional. I mean, people, you know, it's hard to argue with data. <laughs> you, know? I mean, you know, it's hard. So, I mean, we, we've, that's kind of the, the, the basis in which we've really built our business. So. <laughs> And on that note, so I will turn to some of our students who are also interested in data, but certainly entrepreneur, entrepreneurial ventures and other things. Um, there was a question that came in, Daryl, to maybe uh, double click on your leadership style and how that has um, you know, served you during this time of COVID with your team. Well, uh, great question, because you know, as I have as you ask that question, it may appear selfishly like all these things that we do in my company is me, but no, I have 350 colleagues who work really, really hard and, you know, I, I couldn't do it without them. And, you know, leadership in, in this time is very, very, is, is a very challenging thing. And, and, you know, we're, most of our leaders are in our office in Irvine, um, but, you know, we, um, and, and you, we kind of relied on being around each other to be able to interact and things. And then when, when COVID hit, we started having every other day check-ins and just the 12 most senior people in the company. And what are you hearing? What's going on here? What's going on there? And we really realize that we are now, we, we're a better company because we do that every other day, which is something we didn't do before COVID because we just relied on, we'd have a weekly meeting and, you know, but these, these every other day where we get real time things that are issues in this community or that. Um, and so, you know, I, I think leadership is in this time frame, uh, it's a lot of visibility. And, you know, I, I was very visible, you know, I go to every one of our properties at least twice a year and not being able to do that on the travel, we had to come up with other ways of doing that. And with, you know, when using technology, Zoom and the like, um, but, you know, I think just being uh, very, very visible with people and listening to people and, and also just letting them know that, you know, like all of our maintenance techs who do a tremendous job of serving our residents, I have, I said, look, I've said it to each and every one groups. I said, your safety is the most, is the most important thing for me and the safety of our residents. So if you feel that you don't want to go into an apartment because of a concern, if people aren't there, we've asked residents to leave an apartment while our tech was servicing it. And, you know, so we've come up with some pretty hard, fast protocols where we want to ma maximize the safety of our team. And so 
you know, it, it's an uh, it, it's setting a tone of what uh, in this difficult time that you care and you care about them and their welfare and we care about our residents as well. Such a great point about health and safety and also a follow on to one of the questions uh, from our students who are interested in thinking about how, uh, you know, you and the company have thought about real estate as part of the healthcare system. Now that people are doing to tel telehealth at home and receiving some of those, uh, that care and service at home. And so the question really centers around how you think that might affect the design of apartments and um, how they might be equipped differently in the future uh, due to well, that. Mixing. You know, there is a absolute connection between healthcare and housing. And, you know, one, one example that I'm very proud of, we, uh, we own, I mentioned briefly, we own about 15 or 20 apartment communities that are age restricted, that are seniors, affordable communities, probably the average age of our residents would be about 76 who live there. And these are all now they're starting out they don't, th these are not assisted living, they're independent living um, uh, housing. We, you know, we started something a few years ago, we wanted to do, um, to keep our seniors healthier longer, we started, you know, we started looking at how, what can we do in terms of wellness, and then we found out, I mean, part of, of uh, my business has been to just try things and ask people questions. So we we happen, you know, we own three, we own five seniors communities in the DC area and um, uh, in New Jersey that uh, we just happened to meet someone from the University of Maryland Medical Center and they had this huge community health outreach initiative. And they encouraged us, they said, well, you know, if you build a examination room at each one of your facilities, we'll send nurse practitioners and doctors there on a regular basis. So we did that at five communities. I mean, which, in what is fascinating, I would say the demographics of these communities, they're low moderate income seniors, probably 60% uh, African-American or Latina. And um, we, and so all these places where we had regular well checks and we had, you know, healthy cooking classes and Zumba, we did all these things. In those five communities, which again, um, seniors, uh, people of color, which was hit hard by COVID. And I would say in those five communities, we had a thousand people, maybe, we had one incident of COVID. And there has to be a correlation. I mean, I, you know, the, and, and I, I do believe that, um, so, you know, wellness is going to be a huge issue, you know, given the, the aging, us aging baby boomers. And, um, and I think in, in apartment design, I mean, you know, uh, we, I mean, we spend a lot of time focused on trip hazards and things in our communities and, and accessibility in terms of entrances. So it is a major part of what we do. And, um, and, and, you know, healthy, you know, I mean, there are things, of course, there, there are things in older apartment communities like lead paint and substandard water and things like that, that we, you know, those are low hanging fruit that we try to fix. But, you know, health is a key part of uh, the housing business. And I think that linkage will, will continue. And in fact, um, after COVID. What an incredible investment and clearly it paid off in those communities. So, you know, uh, there was a question about recognizing all of your success in the apartment uh, space and apartment unit space. And there was a question, there were three questions actually. The first was um, any plans for extending um, or making investments in temporary housing? That came from an EMBA who travels to Boston every few weeks. And so um, I think that that was a sort of a self-serving question there, but also <laughs> on the uh, single family um, units and also in the storage uh, area. Have, have you looked at investments there and how do you think about those? You know, well, it's interesting because temporary housing, which, you know, uh, we haven't looked at it. Um, what's interesting is the single family rental space. I mean, that's been a space that has 
really picked up steam with large companies like Blackstone and a few others making investments there. And, and that's one that we kind of have our eye on because there, it's another form of affordability. Because one of, the, one of the interesting things about the apartment industry, since 2000, only 8% of what has been built in the apartment industry are uh, a bigger than three, uh, bigger than two bedroom apartments. So most of our new construction is focused on the millennials and smaller apartments, one and two bedrooms, where we have noticed that our biggest demand are on large, we focus on either creating large bedroom count or buying places that have it. So, you know, we actually have about 10 of our communities with four bedroom apartments. Those do not turn over and the demand is off the chart. And three bedrooms are very similar because there are very few three bedrooms. And so, and most of our three and four bedroom families are multi-generational families. And there is so much demand which gets into the single family rental space of having large bedroom count for, you know, uh, for multi-generational families. I think it's a huge business. It's also part of I think the, the long-term healthcare solution for many of our aging seniors, because we have, don't have enough nursing homes or assisted living, so we are going to have a generation of people that will be aging in place, and that large bedroom count apartments help do that. So important. Um, so our students are interested in entrepreneurial ventures, and so there was a question about what you see as some of the biggest pain points in the affordable housing space and maybe some of the biggest opportunity as they think about uh, entering, uh, exiting the MBA experience? Oh, the biggest pain points. You know, one of the things that we need to do and in, in, is just getting, you know, our, more communities to adopt um, more unique construction um, techniques, for instance, modular construction, which is big in China and many other countries. We just do a fraction of that in the U.S. And in certain communities, it's virtually impossible. And, you know, and, and, and we can count my home state of California. And part of it is there's still concerns about seismic issues and stuff like that. But we're actually building a ground up development in Detroit where we're using modular housing, where a lot of it will be built factory and shipped. And we have to do things like that. And, and, and there are just some things that we, that, that I'm sure within MIT on the other side of campus, there's all kinds of innovation and construction that is going on and that exists and getting more municipalities to adopt it. And so I would say that if, if I were looking and thinking about starting today and what would I look at is how do we create some quicker ways of building things um, and specifically using modular construction, which in, in some respects has been adopted in other places. It needs to be adopted in the US. Really good point. So maybe one last question here about going back in time. What would you have spent a little bit more time doing while you were here at MIT? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I probably, uh, what would I have been doing? I, you know, I probably would have gotten to know better many of my classmates. I, I got to know quite a few, but I look and think of, uh, you know, some of those relationships and how they have helped me over the years and, and, and the, the not helped me, but just the enrichment of that. So certainly can bonding more with my classmates, that's one thing. I would also say that, um, you know, there were a lot of things that, you know, you, I mean, and I was, I was relatively young. I was done there when I was 24 and I just didn't have the, the wealth of experience, but I would have focused a lot more in, you know, on international learning the international, I mean, I've learned a lot of it because we now have about a third of our investors are Europe and Asia and I've navigate that, but I wish I'd learned that a little bit earlier. Um, so that's probably the one thing for me now today, that's all hat for the students today, but you know, 
few generations ago, it wasn't the, the most innovative. I mean, a lot of people didn't do that. Right. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for sharing your insights and all of your experiences, Daryl. It is always a joy to hear from you. And for the students who are joining us in our small group session, you'll need to exit this uh, Zoom link and join the other. And so. And I stay put right here. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Hey, Daryl, I can't resist asking one, one last question. So um, you're so visible um, uh, in public settings, uh, in the public arena, as well as in private enterprise. Um, when, how, or if, um, you know, serving in public office, uh, is that ever something? No, that <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Let me rephrase the question. How could we get you to think oh. about that kind of, uh, anyway, I, I couldn't use it. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Girl, thank you so much. All right. Uh, no, be safe and be well. Thank okay, you, so what happens now? We'll exit into the other um, okay, Zoom. Okay, great. Line.